Thank you, Dr. Manis. Um, so first off, I, I do want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Black for his um, help with this presentation. And so the objectives of uh, today's presentation are to define non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer disease states based on BCG exposure, to review the biology of BCG response in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and to review the current and novel bladder sparing treatments for BCG unresponsive uh, disease. So to give a little bit of background here, um, bladder cancer is the fifth most common uh, cancer worldwide with a rising incidence in Canada of 25 cases per 100,000 in um, 2020, uh, previously um, 21.8 per 100,000. So with a disease ratio of male to female of three to one, it accounts for about 8.1% of all cancers diagnosed in men. And as you can appreciate on the right hand side graphs, um, bladder cancer is especially prevalent in North America, Europe and Northern Africa, with the highest um, mortality rates being in Europe and North Africa. Um, and upwards of 75 to 80% of patients diagnosed have non-muscle invasive uh, disease at the time of diagnosis. So, you know, bladder cancer is a particularly challenging disease because it's known to have um, high rates of recurrence, treatment failure, and progression to muscle invasive disease. Um, it's also... Um, yeah, costly disease to manage. Uh, and it was estimated that in the US in 2020, the cost of treatment was around $5 billion um, per year. And this was not only related to the treatment of the disease itself, but also to the extensive surveillance required leading to frequent office visits, cystoscopies and repeat TORs um, in the non-muscle invasive disease state. And finally, when looking specifically at high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, the five-year risk of recurrence can be upwards of 80%, and the risk of progression is estimated to be around uh, 15 to 20%. It's also important to talk about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer risk stratification. So uh, low risk refers to uh, papillary urethelial neoplasms of low malignant uh, potential and primary solitary and small uh, low grade TA. Intermediate risk refers to recurrent multifocal or large uh, low grade TA. An intermediate risk can uh, be further subdivided based on risk factors. So patients in that category that have primary small and solitary high-grade TA disease or that fall um, in the intermediate high uh, risk subcategory should be considered for treatment as high-risk disease. And then finally, the high-risk category refers to any T1 recurrent or multiple or greater than three centimeter high-grade TA or any CIS. Um, and there's also a a very high uh, risk uh, subcategory, which um, refers to a uh, disease with histological variances. So to give a little bit of background on uh, BCGs, BCG refers to a number of variants derived from a strain of Mycobacterium bovis. It was attenuated over 100 years ago by Calmet and Guérin, uh, working at the Institut Pasteur in Lille. And the process took about uh, 13 years to achieve from 1908 to 1921. And it was initially developed as, uh, as you know, as a vaccine for uh, against TB. And Dr. Alvaro uh, Morales, who's a Canadian uh, urologist, postulated that it could be used as a form of intravesical immunotherapy against non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And so it was administered uh, intravesically to the first patient in 1973, with the first results being published in 1976 in the Journal of Urology. And today, intravesical BCG is used to treat and prevent tumor recurrence in patients with intermediate and high risk uh, non muscle invasive bladder cancer. And usually, a TRBT is, you know, almost always performed before um, uh, BCG induction and initiated. Um, followed by maintenance. So unfortunately, many patients go on to have disease progression despite adequate BCG treatment, which highlights the need for new effective treatments for this patient population. It's also important to have a good understanding of the non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer disease states based on BCG exposure. So to start off, adequate BCG uh, refers to at least five of six installations of induction, as well as at least two of three maintenance doses or two induction courses of BCG. BCG intolerant refers to disease recurrence or persistence after failure to receive 
adequate BCG therapy due to severe adverse effects. BCG refractory refers to high-grade T1 at the first evaluation following induction BCG, so at three months, or persistent or recurrent uh, high-grade TA or CIS following adequate BCG six months. Um, now, BCG relapsing refers to high-grade recurrence after reaching disease-free state within six months of receiving adequate BCG. And finally, BCG exposed refers to high-grade persistent or recurrent non-muscle invasive within 24 months of the last BCG dose, but not meeting the definition of BCG unresponsive. Now, finally, the uh, focus of this presentation is uh, BCG unresponsive disease, which is defined as high-grade T1 at the first evaluation following induction BCG, recurrent high-grade T1, um, or TA, I should say, and T1 within six months of adequate BCG treatment and uh, recurrent CIS within 12 months of the last adequate BCG treatment. And I want you to note here that the orange boxes highlight that BCG unresponsive captures both BCG refractory disease and early relapse following adequate BCG treatment. Now, before talking about why BCG unresponsive um, disease happens in certain patients, we need to understand how BCG works in the first place. So it's been postulated that uh, following BCG um, installation, BCG attaches to and then invades the urethelium. And when there is a robust infiltration, BCG then induces an innate immune response, um, including cytokine expression and immune cell infiltration. And the degree at which this is happening will continue to increase uh, with each subsequent um, installation. And this will eventually prevent uh, disease recurrence and progression. But uh, if there is a failure to induce a robust infiltration, this results in an inefficient adaptive immune response. And a robust innate response is necessary to support a strong um, T helper one cell based adaptive uh, immune response. A T helper T, uh, two cell um, based uh, T cell response doesn't really provide adequate protection. And overall, an appropriate host response leads to lasting protection against tumor recurrence and progression. Now, looking at this on a cellular level is also important because it highlights the various targets for immunotherapy in patients with BCG unresponsive disease. Tumor microenvironment uh, favors T regulatory cell expansion or recruitment through mechanisms that aren't really well defined or understood, but might include IL-10 and TGF beta uh, secretion in the um, by the bladder uh, tumor cells that express S1P1 receptor via C um, CCR for T regulatory cells. And in addition, uh, immunosuppressive uh, PDL1 T cells are particularly enriched during BCG treatment, in part via the interferon beta uh, secreted by BCG stimulated urethelial cells. And the ratio of uh, type 1 T helper cells and type 2 T helper cells in patients with bladder cancer is usually shifted um, towards the unfavorable T helper 2 profile but BCG therapy can reverse the balance. Um, and notably increased um, T helper 1 cytokine levels are associated with a good uh, clinical response to BCG therapy, probably through uh, the ability of T helper 1 cells to induce anti-tumor cytotoxic uh, CD8 T cells. Now, Strangard and colleagues published a study where uh, they paired pre-BCG and post-BCG urine and tumor samples, and they included 70 patients with high-grade recurrence and 83 patients without high-grade recurrence. Um, an analysis of their urine proteomics uh, showed that there was an immune activation signature after BCG therapy, consisting primarily of uh, INF gamma uh, inducible proteins like CX, uh, CL9, 10, and 11. And they also found that patients with high grade recurrence had higher levels of immunoinhibitory proteins like PD1, PDL1, and CD70. And their urine after BCG treatment than those without a high grade recurrence. And then they performed a whole exome uh, sequencing and RNA sequencing of the tumors. They found um, that very few genes were different between the non-high-grade uh, recurrent disease and the high-grade recurrent disease uh, before BCG therapy. But um, several inhibitory proteins like LAC3 and CTLA4 were more highly expressed in the high-grade recurrent disease than in the non-high-grade uh, recurrent disease after BCG um, treatment. 
They then applied this exhaustion spore uh, based on CD8 T cells and exhaustion genes. And this showed that high grade um, recurrent tumors had a significantly higher exhaustion uh, score following BCG therapy. And this correlated positively with uh, PD1 immunohistochemical staining. Um, so I think all in all, the specific pathway by which BCG unresponsive disease emerges is still unclear, but um, this study does highlight some of the potential factors at play. Now, in terms of management of this disease state, uh, radical cystectomy is recommended in patients with BCG unresponsive T1. The COA guidelines suggest that a second line bladder uh, sparing treatment can be considered before cystectomy in patients with uh, CIS or high grade TA. And um, this is presumably uh, because the short term risk of progression is lower in these tumor types. Um, the study by her and uh, colleagues included 307 patients with high-risk non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer that were treated with TRBT and BCG. And these patients were followed over the course of 15 to 20 years. The primary endpoint for the study was uh, disease-specific survival. Now, of the 307 patients included, 90 went on to have a radical cystectomy. And of those, 44 or 49% um, who underwent a cystectomy had a median survival of 96 months. Um, 35 patients had a cystectomy for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer after treatment failure. And the early cystectomy cohort uh, had surgery within two years after initial BCG uh, treatment. Uh, and of those that underwent an early cystectomy in this group, 92% were still alive at year 15. And of those that underwent at 92%, sorry. And of those that uh, underwent a delayed cystectomy, 56% survived to 15 years. Now, 55, patient, uh, 55 patients had uh, progression to uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer, unfortunately. Um, and of those uh, that had early cystectomy, 41 survived to a 15 year while um, only 18 uh, patients of the 18% uh, of the patients. Uh, in the delayed cohort survived to 15 years. So the overall disease uh, specific survival rate was 69% in the early cystectomy group and 26% in the delayed cystectomy group. So even though it's clear that the risk of occurrence and progression is reduced when a cystectomy has been performed, it's still challenging to determine what the best timing is to offer operative management to um, patients that fall in this uh, in this category. And in 2008, Benzinger and colleagues um, performed a study looking at 105 patients with high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And they offered upfront cystectomy to all patients uh, that were candidates and subsequently looked at cancer-specific survival um, based on early cystectomy, meaning on average four weeks following initial TOR, or the late cystectomy, uh, which occurred following uh, recurrence after BCG treatment or progression to muscle invasive disease. And it found that 51% of patients that opted for 51% um, uh, of patients opted for upfront uh, cystectomy and 49 elected to proceed with a delayed cystectomy. And their analysis showed that the 10-year cancer-specific survival rate was 78% for the early cystectomy group and 51% for the delayed cystectomy group. They also found that the survival uh, in the survival analysis that CIS was related to lower cancer-specific survival rates um, in the uh, deferred cystectomy group. Obviously, the practice patterns have changed since 2008, but I do think this highlights that we still don't have an exact recommendation of the perfect timing for cystectomy in this patient population. Now, the second part of this presentation is going to focus on um, bladder sparing treatments. Um, these are usually offered to patients who refuse cystectomy or who are medically ineligible for the operation. And we'll cover both um, current and novel therapies being developed in the management of uh, BCG and responsive disease. I do want to highlight here that um, these trials are all done in BCG responsive CIS because it's believed that CIS cannot be completely eradicated by TOR. And therefore, the complete response rate noted at three or six months is thought to demonstrate true drug um, efficacy. However, for patients with high-grade TA or T1 disease, TRBT plays a huge role in the disease process, which is why a lot of the treatments are FDA approved for CIS with or without a high-grade TA or T1, but not for um, 
high grade TA and T1 alone, since you know RCTs would be really nice um, to to perform in this um, in this cohort uh, to really control for the effect of TRBT. Um, so first off, intravesical uh, chemotherapy, so gemcitabine and docetaxel. So in terms of mechanism of action, gemcitabine inhibits DNA synthesis by acting um, as a dioxycytidine nucleoside analog, and it results in cell apoptosis. Uh, docetaxel inhibits tubulin uh, disassembly and thereby inhibits cell division. And given these mechanisms of action, gemcitabine is administered first because it does require active DNA synthesis for its effectiveness. Now, the usual protocol involves the sequential intravesical gemcitabine installation with a dwell time of 60 to 90 minutes and then docetaxel for 60 to 120 minutes. The induction period involved um, weekly treatments for six weeks, followed by maintenance with monthly treatment um, for 12 to 24 um, months. Now, typically, the side effects experienced are gross hematuria and irritated blood, and some patients are pretreated with um, sodium bicarb in the evening before and in the morning of treatment um, to help alkalinize their urine. And this is thought to prevent some of those irritative symptoms uh, related to the acidic gemcitabine, which has a pH of 2.5. Now, this trial by uh, Steinberg and colleagues retrospectively assessed 276 patients uh, treated with sequential intravesical gemcitabine and docetaxel. Only patients with a history of uh, BCG treatment and recurrent non-muscle invasive bladder cancer were uh, included, and 38% of this cohort was uh, BCG had BCG unresponsive um, disease. Now, in terms of outcomes, they essentially assessed recurrence-free survival and high-grade recurrence-free survival at year one and year two for all patients. And what you can appreciate in figure A is that um, the one-year recurrence-free uh, survival rate was 60%, and the two-year um, RFS was uh, 46% in all treated patients. And figure B highlights that at one year, the high-grade RFS was 65%, and at uh, two year, the high-grade RFS was 52%. Now, the figure at the bottom uh, right uh, right here um, assessed specifically patients with uh, BCG unresponsive disease and highlighted that um, the two-year high-grade uh, RFS is 50% for the CIS cohort and 58% for the high-grade papillary um, disease cohort. They also performed a COX uh, regression analysis and found that clinical stage CIS, number of prior BCG failures or uh, BCG unresponsive status didn't really um, have a statistical uh, significant effect on disease recurrence. Now, the next few slides are going to focus on immune checkpoint um, blockade. So looking at the mechanisms, uh, mechanism of action of pembrolizumab, so activation of um, T cells first requires an APC or antigen presenting cell, like a dendritic cell, to present an antigen. And in this case, the APC presents a tumor antigen complex to an MHC class 1 to the T cells, uh, via the T cell receptor or TCR, which you can see here. Um, at this point, B6 on the APC can bind to CTLA4 on the T cell and then creates an inhibitory signal. But anti-CTLA4 uh, antibodies can inhibit the inhibitory signal by binding to CTLA4 um, uh, antibodies. Um, and then once the activated T cell is in the tumor environment, it can recognize the antigen presented by the APC cell in the tumor. Um, at this point, the programmed uh, cell death or PD-1 receptor can also send an inhibit in an inhibitory signal to the T cells uh, when the receptor binds to uh, PDL1, which is often expressed on tumor cells. An inhibition of PDL1, for example, with acetazolamab um, or PD1, uh, for example, pembrolizumab, is thought to block the signal. And previous studies have also linked an increased PDL1 expression to tumors that uh, relapse after BCG treatment. So in this trial by uh, Baller and colleagues, as you know, uh, Keynote uh, 057 was published in uh, 2021. 
It was a phase two multi-center open label single arm trial evaluating pembrolizumab in the BCG unresponsive disease state. And patients received pembrolizumab 200 milligram IV every three weeks for up to 24 months. 101 patients were included in this study and all patients had CIS with or without uh, hybrid TA or T1 disease. And every patient received at least one dose of Pembro, uh, 200 milligram IV. And of the 101 patients, 96 patients ended up meeting the uh, criteria for the efficacy analysis, but all patients were included in the safety analysis. The primary endpoint for this study was clinical complete response rate at three months. And this was assessed by cystoscopy and urine cytology, but no biopsies were uh, performed. The complete response rate at three months um, was 41%, but this drops to 39% at six months and 19% at 12 months. So as you can see in figure B, all the green dots you can see here represent a point in time where a patient had a occurrence of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And only about 18 of the 96% um, included in the efficacy analysis had a complete response at uh, 12 months. And finally, in terms of toxicity, 13 patients experienced a grade um, three to four adverse event, mostly, most commonly hyponatremia and arthrology as and eight patients experienced a serious drug uh, related um, adverse event. This is currently FDA approved uh, for this indication for this patient population. Um, so results of the uh, Keynote 57 cohort B um, were presented by Nechi and colleague at the GU ASCO uh, Symposium in 2023. And cohort B included only patients with high-grade TA and T1 disease without CIS. And patients received pembrolizumab 200 milligram IV to three weeks for median of 9.5 cycles. And so here, 132 patients received pembrolizumab and were included in the analysis. And the primary endpoints were disease-free survival at 12 months and safety. They found that the disease-free survival at 12 months was 43.5%. But as we discussed earlier, with high-grade TA and T1 disease, TRBT plays a huge role in the disease scores. So without an RCT assessing uh uh, drugs in this setting, we can't really determine what part of the response is attributed to the drug itself uh, and its efficacy versus uh, TRBT um, that they previously underwent. Um, and finally, in this study, uh, 97, pa uh, 97 patients experienced a treatment-related event uh, with 14 having to stop treatment due to drug-related uh, adverse event. Now, uh, in terms of pembrolizumab toxicity, the Keynote 57 uh, reported a rate of 66% of treatment-related adverse events with 13% um, of the patients enrolled experiencing a grade 2 to 3 adverse event. 13% of the patients enrolled uh, experienced a grade 2 to 3 and 13% uh, required treatment interruption. Uh, and 7% uh, of the patients uh, had to discontinue the treatment because of the severity of the adverse events. Um, in terms of immune-mediated uh, reactions, generally speaking, they can be quite severe, ranging from pneumonitis and colitis to hepatitis and hematological toxicities. And then some of the milder, more common uh, symptoms are MSK pain, nausea, and fatigue. But all in all, given the toxicity of the drug, it does require periodic uh, monitoring. Now, another trial looking at um, immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy is the SWOG S1605 trial by Dr. Black and colleagues evaluating the efficacy and safety of atezolizumab monotherapy in the treatment of BCG unresponsive uh, high-risk uh, high high sorry, uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And so uh, in this study, patients received atezolizumab, uh, 1200 milligram IV every three weeks for up to 17 cycles. And this was a phase two single arm study where 172 patients were initially enrolled with 166 uh, patients receiving at least one dose of the drug. And um, they were included in the uh, safety analysis but ultimately 129 patients were eligible and were included in the efficacy um, analysis. The primary endpoint for this study was complete response rate for patients with CIS 
as determined by a mandatory biopsy at six months. It was defined as the absence of high-grade disease on biopsy and absence of evidence of upper tract disease and uh, urethral recurrence. Now, uh, the secondary endpoints were treatment-related um, adverse events and event-free survival rates at 18 months for patients with non-CIS tumors. And EFS was defined as first occurrence of biopsy-proven high-grade disease in the bladder, high-grade disease in the upper tract, or prostatic urethra, or progression to muscle invasive, as well as death to any cause. And here the authors found that at six months, a complete response was observed in 20 of the 74 patients with CIS. A three-month analysis was also performed, and it showed that 32 of the 74 patients, so 43% uh, percent of patients with CIS, had a clinical complete response, which is similar to the findings reported in Keynote um, 057 and likely highlights the slow nature of CIS which takes time to progress. But um, of the 20 uh, patients or 27% with a complete response at six months, um, the median duration of the response was 17 months. And as you can appreciate on the right hand side, 56% uh, maintained response uh, at 12 months. In the High grade TA and T1 cohort, um, the event free survival rate was 49% at 18 months. So finally, as seen in previous studies with immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, toxicity is quite significant with 16% uh, of patients uh, experiencing grade three or five treatment related um, adverse events, and unfortunately three deaths related to the study drug. And all of this taken together with the moderate efficacy of uh, checkpoint inhibitors doesn't really make them an attractive option for um, BCGN responsive, uh, non muscle invasive bladder cancer, at least not as a monotherapy. Now, the Sunrise trial um, is an RCT uh, looking at the efficacy of TAR 200 and citrilimab in the treatment of BCG unresponsive CIS with or without um, papillary disease. And the preliminary data was recently presented last spring at the AUA meeting in Chicago. So TAR-200 is a novel drug delivery system that allows for continuous local release of genocytobine in the bladder, and it relies on an osmotic system for drug delivery. And then citrilimab is a PD-1 inhibitor um, like pembrolizumab. So as you can see the photos here, this um, shows a, a bladder with uh, the TAR-200 um, device within it. Now, um, this study included three cohorts. So cohort one received TAR-200 and citrilimab, cohort two received TAR alone, and cohort three received citrilimab alone. And results from the combination group, so TAR and citrilimab, have not been uh, reported yet. But patients that received TAR-200 um, Q three weeks for uh, 24 weeks, and then every uh, 12 weeks through uh, week um, uh, 96, and then citrilimab was administered through uh, week 76. Now, the primary endpoint was overall uh, complete response rate, which was evaluated by cystoscopy, urine cytology, and biopsy at week 24 and 48. And the key secondary endpoints uh, for this uh, study were duration of response, overall survival, pharmacokinetics, and health-related uh, quality of life and safety. The authors found um, in this study that 16 of the 22 patients, or 72.7% in the TAR-200 group, achieved an overall um, complete response, compared to 8 out of the 21 patients in the citrilimab uh, group, and this comes to 38%. After a median follow-up of 11 months, 15 of the initial 16 responders uh, were had ongoing um, uh, response and duration of response was not reached. Now, most treatment-related adverse events were grade 2 or less in the TAR group. Now, overall, um, despite the sample size being small in both groups, this preliminary data uh, does generate some excitement around TAR-200. Uh, um, meanwhile, the findings uh, of citrilimab uh, only group are consistent with the previous trials looking at PD-1 inhibitors, which 
emphasizes uh, some more that PD-1 inhibitor monotherapy is probably not a great option for patients with BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. So uh, we're just going to shift gear here towards uh, viral gene therapy for the uh, next uh, few slides. So natopharagene is a non-replicating recombinant adenovirus that delivers a copy of the human interferon alpha 2b gene to um, urethral cells. And it's combined with SYN3, which is a surfactant that enhances the viral transduction uh, of the uh, urethelium. Um, this results in the production of local interferon alpha 2b, which has anti-tumor activity and leads to tumor regression in preclinical trials. Um, the proposed protocol uh, consists of single uh, intravesical installation of 75 cc dose of natopharagene and repeat dosing at uh, 3, 6, and 9 months is given in the absence of high-grade recurrence. Now, Bujan and colleagues um, published their findings in 2021, and they, uh, they conducted a phase 3 multicenter open-label uh, repeat dose study. Eligible patients received a single uh, 75 cc dose of intravesical natopharagene, and this was repeated at month 3, 6, and 9 in the absence of high-grade recurrence. A total of 157 patients were given at least one dose of treatment, and 151 patients were included in the efficacy analysis. Of those, 103 patients had CIS and 48 had high-grade papillary disease without CIS. And their primary endpoint here was complete response in the CIS cohort at any time within 12 months from the first dose. At the 12-month mark, they also conducted mandatory bladder biopsies at five pre-designated sites. And as you can see um, on the table, the CIS group had a complete response rate at three, six, and 12 months of 53, 40%, and 24% respectively. And then the results from the high-grade papillary group um, were better, but again, it's unclear uh, to what extent prior to your BT contributed to this. Now, in terms of toxicity, 70% of patients did experience some adverse event, but most were transient and related to uh, LUTs. And it was deemed that uh, about 44% uh, of the patients uh, experiencing grade 3 to 4 adverse event um, was related to uh, the drug itself. So only 4%. Only now, um, CG0070 is a selective oncolytic adenovirus that preferentially replicate in tumor cells um, through their defective retinoblastoma pathway. E2F is a promoter that is inserted into the backbone of the virus, and it leads to selective viral replication in tumor cells, but it does spare the uh, normal cells. GMCSF is a sequence gene. It's inserted into the virus backbone as well, and it activates and matures the APCs. All in all, um, CG0070 targets and uh, destroys cancer cells, but it also uh, stimulates an anti-tumor immune response that is T-cell uh, T driven. Now the BOND2 trial looking at CG0070 uh, monotherapy um, trial by Paclam and colleagues is a phase two multi-center open label single arm trial evaluating CG0070 in the BCG unresponsive disease state. They recruited a total of 45 patients of which 36 had um, CIS with or without high grade TA uh, or T1 disease. And their primary endpoint was complete response at six months which was assessed by cystoscopy cytology and biopsy. And their treatment regimen included an induction phase with uh, weekly intravesical installations for six weeks, followed by maintenance, uh, which consisted of uh, repeating the induction cycle at six, 12, and 18 months in the absence of disease recurrence or progression. And then the overall complete uh, response rate was 
47%, and the complete response rate for any CIS and pure CIS at uh, month six was 50% and 58% respectively. The BOND3 trial uh, by Tyson and colleagues is a phase three single arm trial evaluating CG7, uh, CG0070 monotherapy in BCGN responsive um, CIS disease. They recruited a total of 66 patients with um, CIS with or without high grade TA or T1 disease. And their primary endpoint was complete response at any time, which was assessed by cystoscopy, P cytology and biopsy at um, 12 months. And their treatment regimen included a induction phase with weekly intravasable installations for six weeks. And a second induction course was also permitted. Their maintenance, uh, different from the BOND2 trial, uh, consisted of weekly treatment for three weeks, uh, for three weeks at month, um, three, six, nine, 12, and 18, which you can appreciate here, uh, at the top right on their schedule. And then the overall, uh, complete response rate was 74%, and the complete response rate at three and six months was 68 and 58%, respectively. So overall, based on the preliminary results of these trials, CG0070 monotherapy seems to have an acceptable um, safety profile with favorable outcomes for patients with uh, CIS, BCGN-responsive disease. Um, next is the CORE 1 trial by Lee and colleagues, and their trial looked at CG0070 uh, and um Pembrolizumab, so as a combination. And this is a phase two single arm study where 35 patients with BCG unresponsive CIS with or without high grade papillary disease were uh, recruited. Um, their uh, primary endpoint was complete response at um, 12 months. And their secondary endpoints included complete response at any time, uh, progression free survival, duration of response, and disease recurrence. And what they found was that the overall response rate was 85% at any given time point. And it remained, uh, well, I should say overall, uh, and it remained quite high for um, month six and nine. And it was 68% um, percent at 12 months, which is quite good. Um, and toxicity was overall acceptable. So I think one of the things to take away from this trial is that while immune checkpoint uh, monotherapy hasn't proven to live up to the hype, um, this trial definitely suggests that there may be a space for exploring combination therapy in this disease state, which is very exciting for the future. Now, um, looking at intravesical photodynamic uh, therapy. So PDT works by utilizing a photosensitizing uh, drug, in this case, um, TLD-1433. And there is uptake of the drug into the cancer cells via endocytosis um, due to the transferring receptors being overexpressed uh, on the surface of cancer cells. And this generates 1O2, um, which um, are converted to cytotoxic singlet oxygen and radical oxygen species when laser light is activated. And so PD. Uh, T induces an immunologic cell death uh, by uh, inducing autocrine gene expression and the release of damps. And when damps are uh, released, this leads to an effective anti-tumor immunity. This is a single treatment that can be repeated at six months, and it involves intravesical installation of the photosynthesizing drug. And the dwell time is around one hour. And then a uh, green light laser light is delivered into the bladder through cystoscopy for about one hour. And um, this is done obviously with the bladder uh, descended to avoid any wrinkles or folds. And given the discomfort that can be associated with this, this is something that uh, is done under general anesthetic. Um, so in terms of the data uh, behind this, um, Cole Carney and colleagues presented uh, data at the ASCO 2023. And so this was a phase two single arm uh, trial evaluating the efficacy of photodynamic therapy. So 52 patients with BCG unresponsive CIS with or without um, TA and or 
or high grade um, disease. And their primary endpoint was complete response at any point. Um, they also report this indeterminate response subset, which refers to patients with a negative cystoscopy but positive cytology of unclear origin. But this sounds like they would uh, be non-responders, uh, which makes the way that the data was reported um, a bit odd and, and tricky to interpret. And so looking only at complete response at three and six months and 12 months, uh, it was found to be uh, 60, 51% and 31% uh, respectively. And last but not least, um, N803 um, is a uh, IL-15 based uh, immunostimulatory um, protein complex that acts as a activation uh, as an activation and proliferation factor for natural killer cells and T cells. And it was previously postulated that BCG establishes uh, trained immunity, which can be enhanced by a second uh, unrelated stimulus. And the protocol suggested for this uh, drug is intravesical NI installation with BCG weekly for six weeks. And reinduction was offered based on a response at the three month first assessment. And patients who had complete response or were downgraded to low grade TA received maintenance with uh, three weekly installations every three months through month 12 and every six months through month uh, 36. So Chami and colleagues reported their results uh, on the N803 plus BCG trial in 2022. And this was a single arm, open label, multi-center uh, study evaluating the efficacy of N808 in combination with BCG in patients with C um, BCG unresponsive CIS. And so 82 patients were recruited in this cohort. And the primary endpoint was complete response at three and six months. Biopsy was recorded at the uh, was required at the three month mark as well. Now the complete response rate um, anytime is uh, seventy one percent and fifty six percent and forty five percent at six and twelve months respectively, which is encouraging given that uh, complete response rate at twelve months, 12 months. was nineteen uh, percent for pembrolizumab monotherapy, uh, for example. Uh, the possibility, uh, the probability of duration greater than 12 months was 61%, and the median duration was 26 months. And at uh, 24 months, progression free survival uh, was 85%, and overall survivor, uh, survival was uh, 94%, and disease specific survival was 100%. Now, cohort B, which um, included solely patients with high-grade T1 and T1 disease, once again reinforces the need for RCTs in this subgroup to control for the effect of um, TRBT. And finally, uh, cohort C, where uh, patients um, with CIS received NI alone, uh, stopped recruiting at month six due to the, the clear no benefit of NI monotherapy. So overall, this is a very promising trial that warrants further studies because it could potentially represent a future new first line in the management of uh, high-grade disease. So to conclude, um, early radical cystectomy remains the standard of care for management of patients with T1 uh, BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer for patients with um, CIS and high grade TA, BCG unresponsive uh, disease, a second line uh, bladder preserving um, therapy can be considered. Um, immune checkpoint inhibitors don't really uh, seem, uh, do not seem as encouraging as initially believed to be, at least not as a monotherapy, but combination therapy trials, uh, early data is definitely promising. And uh, lastly, it is worthwhile continuing exploring N803 uh, combination therapy as a potential future first line, given that uh, the uh, data we're seeing at this time is very uh, promising. And that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions.